Simon, the last time we were on air prior to today, yeah. of course, we were um, looking ahead to the big fight. The big fight at the weekend, of course, Anthony Joshua's comeback fight against Jermaine uh, Franklin. Uh, we were looking ahead to that. Uh, we were out and about on Friday and the great and the good of the world of boxing were with us. Now, of course, what we saw at the weekend maybe was not what Joshua ideally wanted. He couldn't put Jermaine Franklin away and he won on a unanimous point decision. Sam and you were there. I was yeah. not. We shall hear what you thought of it all in just a second but this was AJ's taking it deep 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 down I'm not happy because ultimately the ultimate goal is a knockout there's nothing that can top a knockout anything short of that isn't what I'm happy with if I'm honest with you but it is what it is as I said I can't look back anymore what's done is done and I can only build on that I'm fighting someone who come in with, um, with a plan to to win he had a good training camp so yeah He's he, he done well. He done well to stay in there. Uh, I wish I could have taken him out. If you were offered a billion white or Tyson Fury next, what, what would you prefer? Uh, well, a hundred percent Tyson Fury. That's the pot of gold. That's the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, bro. That's like that's what it's about. So yeah, de definitely Tyson Fury. So he might want Fury, but is he going to get Fury? That That's a big question, Simon. And uh, while well, we were over at Westfield Shopping Centre on Friday, and of course we were doing all the build-up from there over in West London, all the talk was Joshua's going to go out there and knock this guy out. But he didn't do it. No. He didn't do it. He didn't. Where's your mind now? Does he merit a chance against Fury? Well, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's I mean, first and foremost, if I'm um, uh, anti Joshua's management, I wouldn't put him anywhere near Tyson Fury at this moment in time, based upon what we saw on Saturday evening. Um, if I'm Tyson Fury, I would want Anthony Joshua in a hurry in that ring, because Jermaine Franklin was a very difficult opponent, and I watched it a lot on Saturday evening. I watched Anthony Joshua coming into the auditorium. I watched the expectation. I watched the levels that were expecting, the scrutiny, and all that goes with him. And it must be a challenge for him. But that's what goes with the territory of being Anthony Joshua. And I then I listened to him after the fight talk about people raising their game. Well, people raise their game. It's your job to raise your level. And the levels that you're at as a two-time world champion should be able to diminish those of Jermaine Franklin. To me, he looks like a fighter. I, I, I listened to some of the stuff that was being said by Spencer Oliver and Gareth Davis. I know I'm not supposed to challenge these things. Gareth Davis has been around for 100 years and you can't challenge the orthodoxy <laughs> of a thinking. But they, the, some of the things that are being said about Anthony was better. Better than what? He fought Alexander Usyk, who's been argued to be the pound-for-pound pound best fighter in the world. Was he better than the version that fought Alexander Usyk? No, he wasn't. He was a very similar fighter that seems to be, that seems to have lost an edge. I don't think the belief is there. And the transition to what is the journey that do, we're trying to ascertain. Do you think he fights with too much caution? Do you, because undeniably. Because I, <clears throat> I feel as if... Undeniably. Okay, if you put Tyson Fury in front of him, I think we might see a different fighter. Mm where I think his best bet is to try and knock the man out in front of him. And he, he just felt... This Franklin was quite was quite lively, to be fair. He was he game for six rounds. Punch. And what we saw, what we expected to see, what everyone expected to see, I was sat there, you know, with David Hay and, and Wolf Sahar was there and a whole litany of people that were in the boxing world watching this. And everyone's anticipation was that Anthony Joshua was going to come out and do a number on this guy. And the first six rounds, what you saw was an even fight between one former two-time heavyweight champion of the world coming back into the ring to admonish all the demons and an also-ran journeyman, number 29 in the world fighter that had done well against Dillian, uh, Dillian White, who, by the way, had been demolished, demolished by Tyson Fury. And that's the fight they're advocating for Anthony Joshua for next. Then you saw the next seven rounds where Anthony Joshua's levels went up. He was a better fighter and Jermaine Franklin. But what it worries me is that in order for Anthony Joshua to knock people out, he's got to put himself in the way of a slight amount of risk. And he doesn't seem to want to so do does that. He, yeah. does yeah. he, he, he doesn't fights. want to get in the pocket and let no. his hands go. Yeah. He'll, throw, he'll throw one punch, he'll throw two punches, but he's got to throw threes and fours. And Wilder would be a risk. Oh, if Wilder detonates on Anthony Joshua, which he's perfectly capable of because Anthony Joshua isn't the most skilled of movers... He'll knock him out. Still I, be a big I came away from that fight thinking, fight. I want to see, 
I think he's a remarkable sportsman. I think after the interview, after the fight, the elegance and the erudite and the and the the nature of Anthony Joshua came. It was a concerted effort to be different from the fight that he fought last against Usyk, where there was an outburst. But the manner in which he engaged with the audience, the manner in which he embraced the questions, the humility that he wanted to exude to the audience, and then went out to the fans shows a side that I think people should admire. But when we're talking about elite fighters, and his friends get very cross with me, Michael Jarman gets cross with me, his best friend, and that little camp at matchroom, that little grossy gang get cross about everything <laughs> but the bottom line is is that I worry that Anthony Joshua you know it almost feels like Eddie Hearn is like Colonel Tom Parker he's manipulating these fighters into opportunities that best suit him yeah. he's not Conor Ben over here with yeah. the situation with Chris Eubank it's Anthony Joshua and I worry for Anthony Joshua that the lights have gone out a little bit do you think he overthinks it the fight I think because the warrior it, instinct has to always be But it's be in their there, mind, isn't it? isn't it? Boxing is as much psychological because to get in a ring you have to have a, a mindset which is beyond comprehension for the average person. And Anthony is a supreme athlete, but you want to you've got to go in there and well, you've got to want to be able to destroy someone. Yeah. And he doesn't seem to Now Derek I watched him the whole fight, watched him because I was where I was sat was in the corner directly relational to him and he's engaging with his trainer the whole way. The whole time, in mm. every aspect, every time there's a bit of jeopardy, he's looking at his corner. Almost needing so, reassurance. Some would say that's a good thing, he's engaging, because what we all debated was surely he must have listened to Rob McCracken when he fought Oaks at the first time rounds, and clearly he wouldn't go and box the boxer. Yeah. So it, the ob observation was he doesn't listen to his trainers, he does his own thing. So now we've got the other extreme, which is Anthony Joshua in the middle of a fight. But I have to say, without wanting to water down my perspective, I also saw this remarkable level of engagement and interest and pressure. And you know what? You get paid this kind of money, you want this kind of stardom, it goes with the territory. But I don't think, genuinely don't think, if I'm George Warren and Frank Warren, you know, they perhaps want to make this fight if AJ had been convincing. He wasn't convincing. To put him against Dillian White, Dillian White was somebody he's beaten before and Dillian White got his backside handed to him by yeah. Tyson Fury. Yeah. The levels that were in that fight were remarkable. And he actually, like, he knocked Franklin, well, pretty well at the no, end of the round. No, he didn't. I mean, the Frank he Franklin... He knocked him out at the I end mean, of the, the fight. Hang on, the Franklin-White fight was argued that people think Franklin won that fight. That's why he's in the fight against Anthony Joshua. That's the legitimacy of it. But Anthony Joshua is now at a level that worries me to ever consider well, him I think as many, a world-level fighter. Many students of the fight game are following suit, Simon. Kelvin in Chichester. Kelvin, I think we know you. We've heard from you in the past. I train at a boxing gym, guys, six days a week, so I'm fairly entrenched in the sport. Uh, I've spoken to a bunch of trainers and fighters after the Joshua fight at the weekend. These are the conclusions. Number one, no foot or lateral movement. Number two, no killer instinct. Number three, he looked scared to take a shot. Number four, ultimately too big and too slow. Conclusion, there are at least five heavyweights who would beat Anthony Joshua as we speak. With respect to him, as he time to bow out with his health and wealth intact. At, at, at this current, guys, if we can find a methodology to get Anthony Joshua back to being in the business of taking marginal risks to be able to knock people out, then that, obvious, that conversation will be dissuaded. But the worry for me now, six months out, and people are saying, you've got a new fighter, you're a new trainer, come on, you've got to let him adjust. Whatever the reason is for him not performing at the level people wanted to is the reasons why he's not doing it. I hope that they put him out again, and if it is Dillian White, that we get to see this burning, simmering rage of belief that comes in behind You the think jab. he's lost that belief and confidence? I, I, it looks two years way. without I, winning I think he's ring. lost an edge. Now, I, my big question is, can he get it back? If he can get it back, he's a formidable opponent, he's worthy of being in a world title fight. But if he can't... He's on a road to a trajectory are, that's are, going to be diminishing of him. Are too many, Simon, who run about, and we've seen them of late, with these microphones and all the little um, entourages, yeah. and entourages, are too many of them uh, apprehensive to criticise Joshua? Because yes. somehow it would affect the standing but, but look at it. In, the, in the media game, in the but, media but fight look at, game. look at the indignation that you and I, right? We've come into the boxing world in the last 18 months. I'm a student of boxing for 30 years. I've loved it all my life. I get immersed in the detail, read as many books as you can shake a stick at, been to as many world title fights as any of these pundits, but you dare challenge them. What we do is we go, I'm not interested in a relationship with a fighter. I'm interested in the truth. Yeah. I'm not interested in a relationship with any Hearn and who will give it. Yeah. What's the truth? And then yeah. what happens is people then start to diminish you. They start to say, oh, you don't know this, or you don't know that, or you're the Cape Crusade or you don't do this or you don't do the other when the, the bottom line is that I've n footballers are precious when you criticise them but the boxing world is beyond precious I know yeah. it's a pugilistic sport that takes more courage than anyone can ever ever imagine but you also have to be fair Conor Ben having this ridiculous outburst at Gareth A. Davis I mean I'd have a ridiculous outburst at Gareth for different things 
But nobody on this platform has hammered this ridiculous, insulting argument that Eddie Hearn's put forward on one of the platforms saying that this platform has hammered Conor Ben. Nobody's hammered him. All they've asked him to do, and all, all you, me, Spencer Oliver, Gareth Davis, Adam Catchell, no one has said they wanted Conor Ben found guilty of anything. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. This was a moment, Gareth A. Davis, love him or loathe him, but he approaches Conor Lose. Ben on uh, on Saturday night. Um, he was live on Talk Sport, and then Ben did this. I'm very near Conor Ben, who I just want to say hello to. No, he's knocked the microphone off. He doesn't want to talk tonight, um, I'm afraid. doesn't want to do anything tonight he's, he's got his security guy he's just knocked the microphone out of my hand clearly doesn't want to do anything so uh, that's the arrogance of youth unfortunately um, and uh, well there you go that's that's life unfortunately so Gareth just, just to paint the picture for people that are listening to the radio we've obviously got loads of people in attendance for an Anthony Joshua fight tonight I'm sure that people that do follow Conor Ben on social media are fully aware that Conor was on his way to the arena tonight he has just turned up he's taking his seat ringside uh, he hasn't done any uh, interviews publicly since everything that happened, obviously, on the back of the fallout from his Chris Eubank Jr. fight last October. You've just gone over there to get a word and have a conversation, and he's just knocked the microphone out of uh, out of your hand. Yeah, I don't take it as a slight on me at all. It's not, I think he hit the talk sport microphone. He doesn't want to talk to talk sport. That's what it's clearly saying. He wasn't aggressive towards me at all. Actually, if you're watching at the moment on YouTube and Facebook, you would see uh, the, the incident that occurred between Gareth and uh, Maybe Connor he didn't like ben. his outfit. Uh, and I'm just watching it there. Connor Ben standing, glaring at, at Gareth, and uh, they've got a security guy who's about nine foot ten uh, standing watching it all. It's all a bit... It's, it's all unnecessary, but it's not, isn't it? It's not this. Conor Ben feels a certain way, right? For, for, for and we can understand the reasons why he feels he's entitled to feel this way. He didn't speak to anyone else, so it wasn't just talk sport. And I'm not just defending our platform. I saw him a couple of times. He glared at me for some reason. Another, <gasps> right? How did but, you but, take but, that? <laughs> I, I shrunk. Um, but my point is, is, it's the interview afterwards that Eddie Hearn does with one of the broadcasters. It's an outrage. He has created a culture with this young man where he has not done his job as a promoter. This young man should be exonerating him. There's nobody in the boxing world that wants him guilty. And for Eddie Hearn to be positioning people to suggest that somehow Conor Ben has been hammered and victimised by broadcasters is a complete and utter untruth. Yeah. There's an article in The Guardian about boxing and Eddie Hearn that I implore people to read over the re weekend written by Daniel McRae that will give people an insight as to how this is operating. Because this is not right now. Conor is walking around with this attitude that everyone's got it in for him. All they ever wanted was this young man to be given the right advice. And that promoter, that Pied Piper of a promoter, <gasps> should have taken him to the British Boxing Board of Control, should have defended his reputation, and should have got it done properly, rather than now try to take him somewhere else in the world to fight somewhere else. It is outrageous, this boxing world. Okay. And no wonder boxing fans get up in arms and they're so visceral about it. Infamy, infamy. They've all got it, infamy. That's exactly Thankfully, it. Gareth e. Davis turned around and walked away, uh, ready to fight another day. Uh, snagged a nail, but nothing more. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.